All right. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here in beautiful Montreal, even though it's very cold uh, this time of year. This is actually not the worst. I think I was here in January um, for QSEC a couple of years ago, and that was really cold. So, you know, I can handle this. I have, I have clothes that reach this temperature, at least. Um, I must apologize to all you French speakers, um, despite the fact that I have a very uh, French name. I do not speak any French. I'm an ignorant American. So um, you'll have to deal with my English. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to be here to start off this conference. Um, you know, they kind of invited me uh, with, a, with a blank sheet saying, you know, talk about whatever you want. And so I thought that I would talk a little bit about, you know, what it means to build engaged communities um, in the modern era. Um, so to start off, in a time of drastic change, does the learners who inherit the future? So we're in tech. Presumably everybody is here because you have some relationship to tech. You work in tech, maybe you're a student, um, maybe you just are really passionate about it. And tech is all about change, right? And to illustrate this, in 2008, which by the way is the same year that Python 3 was announced, which when I found that out when I was Googling, I was like, wow, it's been that long. Um, there were 18,000 active open source projects in SourceForge. And uh, for those of you who perhaps were in high school in 2008, uh, the, the SourceForge was the kind of the way you did open source beyond, a, you know, sort of below a certain threshold, right? So yes, there were major projects in other places, but SourceForge was a very popular uh, aggregator of open source projects. Um, in the end of 2016, uh, the GitHub team released basically Google BigQuery access to all of their open source repositories, and there were 21.8 million active public repositories in GitHub in 2016. Um, now, even if you take a generous haircut there and say, oh, well, some of those repositories are, you know, just someone's dot files or copies of others, clones, even if you take a very generous haircut, we're talking about probably a couple of orders of magnitude growth in open source in less than 10 years. So tech is always about change. Now let's switch topics and talk about Python. Python is powerful and fast, plays well with others, runs everywhere, is friendly and easy to learn, and is open. This is from the Python About page, um, but I think it's a great manifesto that really captures a lot of the wonderful things about Python the language and Python the community. Um, and so I'm gonna go through how this really applies to the community and how you can remember all of these little bits and use them in applying uh, it, and applying to the communities that you're in and the teams you're in and any kind of leadership you may find yourself in to help, uh, to help create an engaged environment. Um, but, but first, I'm going to talk about myself a little bit because, you know, I love to talk about myself. Um, so as he said, when introducing me, I'm actually a head, the head of platform engineering at a company called Two Sigma. So a very brief pitch, Two Sigma is a uh, financial, techie financial company in New York City. And we are actually a big, big Python user. So I joined Two Sigma about eight months ago. And my first day, you know, I'm in orientation. And they pull me out of orientation early because there's a really important meeting that they need me to be attending. And that meeting is titled Python 3. So uh, we are really into Python at Two Sigma. Um, we've had a very concerted push to move a lot of our, especially our sort of data science modeling software away from Java world into Python. And we actually have a lot of people who are heavily involved in the Python data science community in the company. So if you're familiar with the Pandas project, we have a number of the people who are related to that project at Two Sigma. So we're really passionate about Python. Even though I must admit that I myself am not a Python expert. Of course, I've written Python. I think everyone in the world has written Python. But uh, I am not a Python expert. I am better known for uh, distributed systems. Um, Apache Zookeeper is one of the projects that I've worked on as an open source developer. Um, and I was a developer for a long time. I was a hands-on developer for many, many years. And I, so I, you know, I did that for a long time. And in about 2011, I decided that you know, I had been a tech lead and I had managed a few people, but I decided that I wanted to take the leap and go work for a startup and, and get some uh, leadership experience and really, really learn how to become a leader. And uh, so I joined Rent the Runway um, and I joined the company as a director of engineering, so I wasn't running the whole show or anything like that. Um, the company was about 15 people in tech. 
And when I left about four years later, the company was about 65 people in tech and I was the CTO, I had been the CTO. So I had this amazing four year period of time where I got to grow myself as a leader, as a manager, um, grow the team, watch the company grow. And it was really stressful and really awesome. And so when I left the company, I decided that I wasn't just going to jump into another job, that I was going to do some other things, relax, you know, startup life can be very stressful. And I ended up writing a book called The Manager's Path. This was published by O'Reilly earlier this year. And um, this is a book that basically I kind of wished existed when I was learning how to be a great manager and scaling from being a manager of individuals to a manager of teams to a manager of managers and a CTO. Um, it is a book about the path of management really in tech. It's really aimed at software engineering managers. Um, and I'm really actually happy with it. It's gotten a lot of you know, good feedback. And the thing that surprises me is that I've gotten a lot of good feedback on it, not just from people who are managers or manager curious, but people who are individual contributors and kind of dedicated individual contributors uh, appreciate it because they can see what the path to management looks like, how they might, you know, interact with their management, um, and a lot of things about leadership. So I hope that many of you will check it out if you haven't already. Um, Ultimately, what I learned, though, in those four years was that building a team is really, really hard. And it is not as simple as I thought it was going in. You know, I thought, hey, look, I'm, I'm smart, I'm charming, everybody loves me, right? Oh, definitely not true. Um, but, you know, I, I've seen it done. I kind of know the basics, you know, have one-on-ones and, like, you know, build cool things. And it's a cool startup, so this will be easy, right? And what I learned was, in fact, building engaged teams is really hard. And I have seen that play out over and over again. I've seen it play out in my life as a manager, at small companies, at big companies. I've seen it play out in open source communities. And so I wanted to talk about this topic today because I think it's relevant to everyone. Whether you are a manager, whether you're an open source developer, you know, all of us are play a part in building engaged communities, whatever communities that we belong to. And so I'm gonna to try to answer the question of what do engineers want? What are the important elements to getting people to be engaged? Um, we're gonna talk about rewards, which are the basis for, con for contribution. We're gonna talk about respect, which is the stickiness of commitment. And finally, ending up with purpose, a feeling of ownership. So let's start with rewards. Rewards, I mean, this is hopefully fairly obvious, right? Why do we do things? Well, hopefully most of the things we do the first time, unless somebody's really forcing us to do it, we're doing it because we think we're gonna get something out of it. You know, we learn things because learning is fun and there's, there's joy in it, right? We take jobs because we think we're gonna get paid. <laughs> uh, economics is an important reward. And obviously this applies to companies. If you're ever starting a company, if you're ever hiring engineers, you will very quickly realize that if you can't pay people, it's hard to hire them. Um, now that doesn't mean that the companies that pay the best hire all the best people and the companies that pay the worst hire all the worst. That's absolutely not true. But it does mean that when you can pay people more money, you can hire more people more easily. Economics gets people in the door, right? People are often driven by some kind of economic incentive. Now this is also applicable for our languages and our open source projects, right? Many people learn, pick their programming languages that they're gonna learn um, based on, yes, they like it, maybe it's fun, maybe it's easy for them to learn, but also they see, hey, wow, there are a lot of jobs for Python developers out there. If I learn Python, I'm gonna be more employable. If I work on this open source project that you know, a lot of these big companies are really reliant on, perhaps one of these big companies will someday hire me. So economics is a pretty important uh, first step to getting people to think about a language or, or a project or a company and getting them in the door. Um, but that's not the only thing you need to do to get people in the door, right? Once, you, once you've got them in the door, you wanna be, make it sure that they can continue to contribute. And it, contribution really requires that they be able to get things done um, and that they be able to kind of move pretty fast. In my experience, moving fast is pretty important for basic commitment engagement. So you've probably all seen open source projects, in fact I happen to run one uh, a little bit, that 
you know, it's very hard to get a code review on it. It's very hard to get someone to look at your pull request and to merge it. It takes a long time to go in between releases. This is really hard, right? Open source projects are hard in this way because so often they're run by volunteers and so they move really slowly. But when they move really slowly, that discourages people from committing to them because nobody wants to go two months between putting a pull request out there and actually getting it reviewed and getting it merged. That sucks. Um, speed is important. Ultimately, engineers like to ship. I have a couple of stories relevant to this in my own life. My very first job out of graduate school um, was at a financial institution, and we were doing a style of sort of software development process called XP, extreme programming. Um, some of you may be familiar with that, maybe some of you aren't. Uh, it's kind of a proto-agile thing. And it was pretty revolutionary for the time. We would do some test-driven development, some pair programming, um, and we would release every week. And for a financial institution with a team of about 40 or so, um, releasing the software every week was actually pretty revolutionary. That was not really all that common. And it was awesome for me because it meant that all of these things, things like pairing, so I was with someone who knew more and could help teach me things, and test-driven development, so there were lots of tests so I could really figure out if a change I made would break things or not, and releasing frequently meant that I had this amazing learning feedback cycle. And it was one of the things that really kept me in tech because up till that point, I just felt like every time I took a job or worked on something big, it was so slow to get anything done to feel like I was making any progress. My second story here is in my time at Rent the Runway, when I joined, you know, the team was having a hard time getting things released. It was maybe, you know, once every two weeks to once a quarter. And we got it better to about once a week, but the release process was really awful. It took hours, and it was one of those painful things where, you know, if you were the person on release duty, it felt like your whole week was chasing people down and cutting branches and running tests and doing merges, and when the actual release was super slow, and it was really no fun. So... We set up an initiative to say that we need to make this faster. We want to make releases super easy. Um, and did a bunch of work, did a bunch of automation. And towards the end of that, I said to the team, hey, how about we make it so that we can release every day? And maybe I should have said, how about we make it so that we can release every hour? But, you know, we went to release every day. And they said, sure. We had to change a few more things about our process, had to make sure our feature flag system was really good. But when we turned that on, it was one of the most... Uh, immediate positive impacts I've ever had on an engineering team, I think. Uh, people were just so much more engaged. They were so much happier at work because they were able to get things done. Uh, do you get to do what you do best every day at work? That is one of the key questions to ask yourself and to ask a team to judge uh, employee engagement. It's actually not just for engineers, for everyone. People want to do the thing that they're good at. They don't want to get caught down, caught down in you know, bureaucracy and slow processes, right? And so as leaders, we want to make sure that people feel like they get to do what they do best as much as possible. Now, ultimately, right, you want to have a great feedback loop. Shipping leads to getting things done, leads to learning. If you believe in the theory of motivation, that motivation is all about you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, learning is what gives us that, mass, that feeling of mastery, right? Being able to learn, being able to do things quickly um, is what helps us master whatever it is we're trying to do. So what does it have to do with Python? Well, let's look back at our manifesto here. Python is powerful and fast and easy to learn, right? Python. Now, we may mean fast in terms of it runs quickly, but I think everybody here probably knows that Python is really fast to get simple things done in. I think this is one of the number one reasons why it is such a powerful and successful language, is that it is just so easy to have an idea and to spin up a quick little Python project and to get it out there, get it done. It's really, really fast. And part of that speed is because it's so easy to learn. I mentioned that, you know, I've written a little Python, everyone's written Python. Everyone has written Python because Python has possibly one of the most easy to use, you know, beginner friendly syntaxes out there. It's just super easy, it's super easy to read. Um, and these are really powerful uh, quali qualities of the language that make it easy for people to join the community and to want to commit to Python. All right, but. Rewards are great, learning is great, moving fast is great. 
I'm sure you've all, however, been in situations yourself or seen situations where somebody joins a team or a company or you know, picks up a language and they love it and they're super engaged for the first few months, maybe the first six months, um, but by a year or a year and a half, they've gotten bored and they've moved on. They've moved on to a new language, they've moved on to a new company, what have you. Um, and the reality is that no, nothing is ever perfect. There is no such thing as an experience where forever it is up and to the right, where things are always smooth, where you're always just having ideas and shipping them and having ideas and shipping them. You know, the reality is that there's always gonna be bumps. Whether it's big bumps, like the company's not doing so well, or little bumps, like, oh, I've gotta write performance reviews and that's gonna take two weeks of my time where I'm, that's all I'm doing, right? Um, these bumps are gonna happen. You're gonna have times when you don't just get those little dopamine hits of reward. Um, and so you need something more to smooth that out, to keep people engaged through those times. And I believe that that really is required, that really requires a feeling of respect. So what do I mean? Well, let's talk about safety. Safety, psychological safety. This is a pretty popular topic in leadership circles these days. Um, teams that feel psychologically safe around one another feel like they are able to make mistakes, ask questions, to be vulnerable. Um, and this is an important baseline for engaged and successful teams, and you do not have to take my word for it. Google has done a bunch of research on their own teams. So one of the things I like about Google is their willingness to do experiments and be very scientific about all things, and that includes things like what makes teams successful. And so they observed a bunch of teams, and what they found was that their most successful teams had a category, had a, had, a, had a bit of psychological safety in their interactions with one another, right? And this is a bit contrary to the stereotype of the sort of aggressive jerk engineer who, you know, is jockeying to be the smartest person in the room. Because you really can't be doing that and have a lot of psychological safety. You have to have room for people to you know, make those mistakes and to ask a dumb question every now and again in order to create this kind of an environment. Now, how do you do that? How do you create that? I think that it really comes down to making your teams feel a sense of relatedness with one another. Um, relatedness is you know, a feeling of kinship, friendliness, community, feeling like you're part of a team, part of the tribe. Um, and if you read a lot of literature on motivation, you know, we have all probably heard again that autonomy, mastery, purpose uh, model of motivation theory, which is very popular, popularized by Daniel Pink. But a lot of people actually believe that relatedness is an important component of motivation for most people. So feeling like they are in a group that they care about and doing things that you know, make the group happy and give them a feeling of pride and respect, right? Having a feeling of pride and respect for being around people that you care about, that when we all do something good, we all feel good about it, we all feel proud to say, I work for this company, I use this language, I'm on this open source project, I work in this team. Now, um, you may have wondered why like, I used this picture in the beginning and it had the hammer, which was in fact one of my nicknames and my last job. Um, I'm not all that good at this, it turns out, or at least I, I, I wasn't very good at uh, developing this on my teams when I first started out as a serious manager. In fact, my very first uh, review as a, as a senior executive, my CEO told me that I was creating a culture of fear, uh, which is really like not a thing you want to hear in a review, I don't think. I mean, I, I don't know about all of you, but like I didn't think of myself as you know, being that kind of a mean or draconian, but it turns out that I was not doing the work to generate that relatedness on my team. I was not doing the work to make people feel like they could be safe. I was holding them to high standards, and I think holding people to high standards is good. That can actually be very motivating for a lot of people. But you need to also make it clear that you care about them, and that if they don't always hit the high standards, that's, that's okay, right? It's better to aim high and fall a little short, um, but still be learning. And so, you know, what I learned in this process is that uh, empathy is a learnable skill. So uh, this quote, always be sincere whether or not you mean it. Um, no one's quite sure who actually really originated that quote, or else I'd have an, a name next to it. Um, but I think it's a great thing to just keep in mind, right? It kind of doesn't matter whether you care about people's lives or not if you act like it. So 
I know. This sounds. This makes me sound like a total sociopath. I realize. I'm. i You know. Speaking of being vulnerable, I'm willing to get up on stage and sound like a sociopath. Hopefully, to help you. You all understand this point. What I found was okay. I wasn't doing any of those things to help my team feel like I cared about them. I wasn't doing things like asking about how their lives were, asking how their families or their dogs or their marathon or whatever it was that you know got them out of bed in the morning that wasn't just work. I wasn't doing any of that stuff to make it clear that I actually cared about them as people. And so I, I realized I needed to start doing that. And so I started doing it. And what I found was that once I started asking those questions, I started caring. <laughs> I actually did, right? You know, it was just simply a matter of like where my attention goes, right? You know, where the attention goes, energy flows. So my energy, now that I was paying some attention to that, actually I started to care more. And they started to care more about me because I was yeah, caring about them and they would start to ask me about myself. And this helped generate a great feeling of relatedness, a great feeling of safety. It really, you know, uh, got us far away from that culture of fear and made the team a lot stronger. And Python, again, bringing it back to our community, right? So, plays well with others and is friendly. I love the fact that these words are in the mission statement here. Um, because, yes, of course, maybe plays well with others means that it is very interoperable with other languages and other systems, but look around you. This is your community, and hopefully you are all going to play well with one another at this conference. Python is a great engaged community. It is friendly. Yes, the language is friendly. It's friendly to use. It's user-friendly. It's maybe beginner-friendly, but my experience with people who are passionate about Python is also that they themselves are friendly. Right? These are important community aspects to building strong language communities. People like to work in languages where they feel like the people that they're going to interact with, the people that they're going to know through that language, if you identify in the tribe of Python, this is great. You're going to identify with people that you know, are collaborative and are friendly. Now, uh, building on that a little bit, I want to make a quick point about partnerships. So, it's one thing to have that relatedness with your intermediate team, with your with your intermediate team, right? With the very few people you work with, um, you know, with the very few people you interact with on a project. Um, but one thing that I actually learned was that you really want to expand people's partnership outside of just their immediate functional area, their immediate team, to appreciate a wider set of skills and a wider set of abilities. Um, at Rent the Runway, one of the early things we did was move towards a model of working where a lot of our teams were very cross-functional. So you would have engineers working with, you know, uh, you would have engineers working with like marketing people or product managers, designers, uh, operations folks, um, even folks in customer service, right? You would have these teams and they were really working together as a team. And this was an important thing for us because it expanded the scope of people's uh, community beyond their functional area. So it wasn't just like engineering is a tribe over here and marketing is a tribe over there and customer service is a tribe over here, but we all started to care about the company as a whole more, right? We expanded our boundaries. And frankly, successful companies, successful projects, successful languages require more than just engineers, right? If you want to make a successful open source project, you are going to need not only people to write great code, that's certainly important, but you need people who will answer questions on the mailing list. You need people who will stand up on stage and give talks like all the great speakers here. Right? You need people who will find bugs. You need people who will shepherd releases. And those are not always the same skill set. It's not always one person that has to do all of those things. So remembering that it's important for us to expand our view of community beyond just what we're good at is going to continue to make you feel more engaged, your whole community more engaged. All right, last but certainly not least, ownership. A sense of purpose. Purpose is like, like maybe the number one cliched topic in, in leadership, motivational speaking, what, what have you, right? Start with why. Why does the company exist? Why does the project exist? Why do the team exist? Why, why, why? And why is super important. It is really important to have a strong vision, a strong mission statement. That is what rallies people, right? When you work for a company or when you work on a project, it's great to work on something that you're like, 
I love the vision of this project. I love the vision of this community. I love the vision of this company, right? Finding value in the world's data, democratizing fashion. You know, the various mission statements for companies I've worked for have been meaningful and they've, they've helped us, you know, kind of visualize this beautiful dream of the future that we kind of want to realize. And so we've got a mission statement here. I keep going through it. We've got a why to some extent. Python is powerful and fast, plays well with others, runs everywhere, is friendly and easy to learn, is open, right? Uh, you know, why Python? Because it's rare to get all of these things together at once. This combination of attributes is a unique combination of attributes. And, you know, powerful. Python is a, is a language that you can do a lot with. Why does this exist? Because we believe that it's possible to have something that is powerful, that runs everywhere, that is open, right? Many of these decisions you could have done without um, and still made a pretty good language, but all of them together give us a great mission statement. But if you want to give people ownership, if you want to make them feel that purpose day to day, um, you need to break it down for them. So my experience is that a lot of people are great with the like high level why, and then they say, okay, and here's all the tasks you need to do, go do them. Um, and that doesn't really help people understand why they're doing what they're doing. Why is the thing that I'm doing right now important? Why this? What is the point of it? Uh, if you want to create a sense of ownership in people around you, and you happen to be in a leadership position, one of the important things that you have to do is break down the grand vision and tie it to the now, tie it to the thing that you're doing right now. You are teaching ownership by teaching people how to break down that grand vision into smaller chunks and to identify paths towards the next stage of our evolution, the next stage of our vision. So you teach ownership by tying the small why this into the large why at all. Now, okay, that's great. Cool. I, hopefully everybody is like, yeah, you know, I dig that. I really like it when I feel like I'm working on something and I know the value of it. I know why it's important to the larger picture. But the danger with this is that a lot of leaders um, want people to have ownership, right? Because when someone has ownership, they go above and beyond. Someone who has ownership is going to do what it takes to get something over the line. If they feel like they own it, you know, whether it's staying up late to finish that last bug or whether it's, you know, working with customer service to help our customers answer a question, whatever. If you feel ownership, you're probably going to do a lot of things that you might not normally do if you're just like, eh, I'm just a coder, I'm just supposed to write some code, I'm just supposed to fix some bugs, whatever, who cares? Who cares when it's done? Um, and so, you know, leaders really like that. But the trick is that you can't give people ownership without them wanting to have an opinion about what's next. Because that's what, that's what ownership is. Ownership is feeling like you are part of the whole vision of a project. You want to help decide where you're going. You want to be part of the success of the whole thing. You want to actually make decisions. That's what an owner does because you have opinions. You care. This is part of your, you know, your world and not just something, some task that you're being assigned. So you've got to be willing to give away that decision making if you start, decide to scale this way, if you decide to scale ownership. You've got to give away your Legos. Um, there's a great blog post by a woman named Molly Graham called Giving Away Your Legos. I think it's pretty easy to remember, so I don't have it linked here. Um, and it's all about scaling. Um, we can look around you know, this conference, right? We are having a great Python conference here in Canada. Um, if the you know, founders and owners of the Python community were you know, brilliant and created a brilliant language and created a great community, but they were very much, you know, control freaks and said, look, we know exactly how we want to run this community. We know exactly how we want all of our conferences to go. And you know what? We just really think that the only people who can run conferences is really us. And we don't really like to travel. We all live in California. So all the Python conferences are going to be in California. Um, and they're going to be great. They're going to be amazing but you have to travel to California to get there. And really not that many people can attend because of that restriction. So maybe you've got this beautiful pure vision by the visionaries of the, you know, the product, the process, the language in this case, um, but you can't scale. It's really hard to scale that vision, that process out to all of the people that you can scale it to if you're willing to give up control, if you're willing to let others take that ownership and do it the way that they want to do it. Um, this is, you know, in my experience, just one of the most important parts of scaling ownership is really being willing to say, okay, here's the goal, um, go execute against it, 
and measure yourself and learn something from it and you know come back and we'll, we'll iterate on it. Uh, at Rent the Runway, we did this thing called product pillars. We would set business goals um, that were pretty high level, right? Improve the customer experience uh, post order, right? And the teams, those cross-functional teams, would actually go away and set their own roadmaps. So it wasn't like the roadmaps were coming down from on high and all the details were coming down from on high. They could actually have that ownership. And that was a third stage of engagement that the people who really felt like they were engaged in those roadmaps, they were making those decisions, they were, the, again, you know, happy to be, to be shipping code, happier to feel like they were part of a larger community than just, ha just tech, and happiest because they actually felt like they had decision-making power over what they were going to build. So all these are great. Um, it's important to remember, though, that just because you get someone from, you know, contribution to commitment to ownership, you can't just sort of leave it there and say, oh, well, you're an owner. Now, now I don't have to worry about the other things, right? Um, if you feel like you are fairly committed to a project, but you can't get anything done, and every release you do is just so slow, you know, it takes forever to get, you know, to get any, you know, ticket approved. Um, if you're committed to a project, but or if you're committed to a company, but you feel like you're underpaid, um, or you're stuck in bureaucracy, that can really undermine your engagement, right? It's just, that is important. That's important, it has to be attended to. Similarly, and we've seen this a lot in open source communities, um, when you love a community and you feel like you have ownership over a big part of that community and you are super engaged, but you feel like that community is not safe for you, is maybe toxic to you, people will walk away. We have seen examples of this in open source. It's very sad when that happens. It's really sad when a community drives people out of it because it's unwilling to you know, engage with the you know, safety aspects of building good collaborative large communities. So all of these parts are interacting and yes, usually you build up to ownership, but once you've gotten there, you have to attend to everything. You can't just let any of them drop. All right. Summarizing, three factors of engagement, in my opinion. Rewards, economic rewards, status rewards, getting things done, learning. You know, just remember that engineers like to ship. And anytime you're in a position where you can make it easier for people to get things done, do so. Uh, respect, safety, relatedness, community, partnership. You know, treating your colleagues as fellow human beings, remembering that we are humans, you know, and, and building those community and empathy relationships. And finally, purpose. Why? Why does the thing exist at all? Why am I doing this right now? Um, and feeling like you, people can own parts of the decision process themselves. Giving away, if you were a leader, giving away your Legos. Python is powerful and fast, plays well with others, runs everywhere, is friendly and easy to learn, is open. So I hope that through and going through this, I've given you you know, a shortcut to remember these different aspects as they relate to your community, as they relate to your language of choice. Um, because things change, right? Uh, we're in the third generation since this photo was taken. It's pretty amazing. Um, and so, you know, if you want to build a successful community that's going to last for the next 20 years and the next generations, right, you will have to continue to engage with it, have to continue to, to learn with it, have to continue to bring that strength, uh, that strength, engagement, respect, um, and community together. And thank you all very much. That's all. Please, uh, if you're interested, uh, buy my book. And, and I'm so happy to have gotten to speak to you today. Thank you.